Hi, and welcome to Learn Fast. In this video, we'll explain how Fast for Words' proven ability to help students with a range of learning and reading challenges is built on brain science research. Clinical Director Devon Barnes discusses the research and talks about the link between students' language skills and their learning and reading abilities. So Devon, thanks for joining us. You've been in the field of uh, brain science and learning uh, for a long time now. Can you fill us in there just briefly? Well, I've been a speech language pathologist now for 43 years. I'm also a trained audiologist, don't currently work in that field. And for the last 20 years, I've specialised in trying to understand uh, why children, some children have a difficulty learning oral language and reading. If I understand this correctly, there was a time when we could only study the brain when it was uh, not alive anymore. I don't want to use the dead word, although I just did. Um, <laughs> True. But now, but now we can study the living brain. Absolutely, and yes. and that has opened up a whole new uh, way of looking at the brain. Is that the right and, way to think and about understanding um, behaviour and and difficulties? Uh, neuroscience also has given us the principles by which we can restructure brains. Yeah, that's a very interesting, uh, a very interesting topic. I believe the word is uh, plasticity. That's exactly right. And mm -hmm. and we are now learning that we can uh, help the brain to reorganise itself. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. or is it a case where we have become aware of the fact that the brain has the ability to reorganise itself, and we just work around that? I think the most important lesson we've learned uh, over the least last few years is that brains can change. We used to think that there was a critical period for brains to develop and after that period that was it you know you had the 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 capacity brain capacity maybe at you know 10 or 12 and you were stuck with that for the rest of your life well we absolutely know that that's not true so is it a case where we now see a clear difference between what you might call a normal brain and a, and a struggling brain absolutely with neuroscience now, we can, for example, look at the brains of children who have no difficulty reading, and then we can look at the brains of children who really struggle to read, and we can actually see the differences in parts of the brain and also see which are those critical brain areas that are involved in reading. Is it a case where you could actually say that things are literally lighting up in the brain? Do, do scans allow us to see it that way? Exactly, that's exactly what they see. So that's that's not slang or colloquialism, Absolutely things not. are actually when, lighting when, up? When we scan a brain with functional magnetic resonance imaging, we give the student a task. So it could be a reading task, it could be a rhyming task. We give them some kind of task that we know is a crucial task for reading. And then we look at the brain so they, they're injected with a certain little chemical that then picks up, the brain actually uses energy, just like a muscle uses energy to move a muscle, the brain uses energy, um, glucose, when it's activated, when a part of the brain is activated. So we're looking at how that part of the brain is taking up um, energy to perform a function. And so then if we look at the brain of our poor readers, we see that those critical areas are not being activated. It sounds to me like it's all about making connections. The concept of listening, language and reading as being a critical set of connections is one that's often spoken about. Can you tell me why that's important? Sure. One of the most important messages I like to get across is that reading is a language skill. Even though it's not oral as such? Uh, but even when you read silently, what are you doing in your head? Well, you're I guess you're talking to words. yourself, aren't you? You're just talking to the words. Now, for children to learn language, first and foremost, they must be able to hear. So if you're born with a hearing loss, you won't learn language easily. So what happens in the child's brain? Every child is born with the capacity to speak any language. And they will learn the language that they're immersed in, the mother tongue. So in a child with fine hearing, their brain then gets fine-tuned to the sounds in the mother tongue. The baby is capable of making any sound that occurs in any language. So when the baby is developing language, it coos and goos and babbles. If it's making a click, we ignore that because it doesn't mean anything. Mm. But if you're a Kalahari Bushman, that click could mean tiger. Yes. And so you will reinforce that click because in that language, that click has meaning. If our baby's living in an English-speaking environment, 
They coo and goo and, as I said, make so- all sorts of sounds. And one day they'll go, dad, dad, dad. Now, the baby is just babbling. They don't know that that means anything, but we do. Yes. And we get excited. So we reinforce that babble and we give it meaning. And that then begins the the process of making connections. Absolutely, and of learning oral language and later on reading. So coming back to the brain science, um, our understanding of now how the brain works helps us to deal with these problems. So we can treat these problems. Absolutely. And and we treat them neuroplastically, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We now have an intervention that's come out of science to remediate the problem. That intervention is called fast forward, and it's come out of 30 years of neuroscience research. Historically, we would normally think of treating uh, psychological or uh, neurological problems with with drugs or some sort of physical intervention. What you're suggesting here is that we can actually train our brains to change and reorganise using principles that we've learned from the research. Absolutely. Uh, This must open up a whole new range of options. Oh. Certainly. And fast forward is one of those. Absolutely. Now, what neuroscience has shown us is not only um, the kinds of exercises that the brain needs to rewire these uh, areas of the brain that aren't functioning correctly or aren't functioning optimally, we also have to make sure that our program is um, adaptive. So if it's the child is doing a program, The program itself has to adapt to each child's skill level, make it a bit harder if it's too easy, drop it back if it's it's, uh, if it's too hard. Another um, principle from neuroscience that's built into the Fast Forward program is that we have to simultaneously develop skills critical to learning. And those skills will be cognitive skills of attention, memory, processing and sequencing, but because we're working on oral and written language, it also has to develop language skills, phonological skills, fine tune that auditory system so that the child has that precise map of sounds, work on all aspects of language, you know, grammar and vocabulary and comprehension. So our fast forward programs have all of those components built in, so they'll simultaneously develop cognitive and language skills. I suppose people are going to want to know who is really going to benefit from this from this product. Basically we could say all children but really in the beginning the fast forward program uh, was designed for children with language and reading impairment and for most schools that's the the group that they target. But we are finding now that the program is also being used for children without difficulty to enhance their learning, to strengthen their brains as well. Also children on the autistic spectrum, it's becoming clear to us that it's a very powerful tool for improving their language and not only do it improve their language skills but we also find that they get a benefit in their social skill development as well. It's also really um, beneficial for children who are learning English as a second language. Do we know the results yet? We have an enormous amount of results. Um, There's over 300 studies that I could share with you, the results of Fast Forward. Some of the results, uh, some of the studies have actually been using brain imaging. There was a study done by Temple and others at Stanford University where they took a group of children, two groups of children, with and without reading impairment. They gave them, uh, scanned their brains and also gave them a series of reading um, tasks. Uh, Then they were given, the the struggling readers were given fast forward and then they again scanned their brains and gave them reading tasks. Not only did we see a huge change in those critical areas of the brain needed for reading, so those areas that did not light up before the program now lit up. Literally. Literally, literally, and their reading and language skills improved as well. So we could see the changes in the brain and also the functional changes in their reading. There are many, many studies being done uh, in schools, mainly in the United States. We have some data from Australia uh, showing um, the positive, very positive changes in um, 
school districts improvement in reading on their national tests like our NAP plan mm. uh, in schools that have implemented the, the fast forward program. Devon Barnes, it sounds like a very exciting field. It is, and uh, I'm very um, privileged to do what I do. So thank you thank so you much. Very much. Thank you for sharing with us.